So what we're going to talk about, so I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on me because I'm a real estate agent, I'm a loan officer, I'm uh, an insurance guy, um, a property manager, kind of a, a little bit of everything. Um, but my core business is all centered around investment real estate. So it's helping people acquire investment real estate. And through that process, they need mortgages, they need the right insurance, they need property management, all of that. And I'll, I'll dive into that. Um, but my goal here today is to maybe give everybody in here a, a tool or two that you're maybe not using right now in this current environment um, to potentially help you get more listings or to help separate yourselves or differentiate yourselves from other agents and being a little bit better of an investment-minded real estate agent. To be able to talk to your clients better or advise them a little bit better. The way that I really position my brand and, and my company is I'm a financial advisor or consultant. I just happen to think that real estate is the best vehicle to help people create wealth. So instead of helping them invest in, in the stock market or write life insurance or annuities or bonds, I help people acquire real estate. And so much of my process with clients is sitting down and analyzing their current financial situation and then looking at how do we diversify, how do we take money from over here to over here, if it's underperforming here, can we perform better? Um, and so it's a really fun process. That's the most enjoyable part for me, is based on what you have to work with, can we be more efficient with it uh, through the vehicles that I offer? And if we can't, we can't, but most of the time we can. Um, and so I get to work with a lot of really cool people. You know, over the last 15, 16 years, I've done over 7,000 purchases. Um, all one at a time. Uh, I work with thousands of different people all over the country. I have clients in all 50 states, and most of my business is across the country. Um, so very different from a normal real estate agent. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with this. We just talked about this on a call, and so I added it to the very fr to the very front. But how many of you are dealing with? Oh, I'm going to wait to buy. Uh, McCray's doing that right now. He's like, man. I'm in a position I could probably pick up another property, but I've just kind of been waiting, okay? A lot of people are doing that, and what are they waiting for? They're waiting for rates to go back down. Why are they waiting for rates to go back down? Because most people shop payment versus price, okay? You'll see that in houses, you'll see that in cars, you'll see that in any, most purchases that are financed, there's more emphasis on what's the monthly payment going to be versus what's the actual deal I'm getting, which I think is fast backwards, but it is what it is, okay? Um, so one of the tools I use right now, whenever I show somebody a, a, a property that they potentially could buy, I show them this is what it looks like buying today, and these are these are the performers we use. I'll dive into this a little bit today. Um, a lot of my business is in Florida, so this is in Central Florida. You can see why, because we get a brand new house, fifteen hundred square feet, three bed, two bath, and it's two hundred eighty grand. Okay, it's just it's just a whole other world um, outside of everything out here out west. But I show them if you buy today at seven percent, we can get the sellers to help us buy down the rate, and we get the seven percent um, on an investment purchase right now. Okay, so you can buy at seven percent on an investment purchase, and your cash flow today, month one, is two hundred and two dollars. Okay, so twenty five percent down. Your positive cash flow. Anything that's positive cash flow in an environment like today is, is huge. Okay? Um, and I show them, and then you're paying 280. So how many people in here think that interest rates are gonna go up over the next call it 18 to 36 months? Or I mean go down. Okay. Um, how much do you think they're gonna go down? Over two to three years. What would what what would you guess? One to two. One to two? Two to three. Two to three? Perfect, I use two, okay? And I think the vast majority of people I talk to when I say interest rates are likely to go down, let's use 2% as the number over the next two to three years, most people are like, okay, I can, I, can, I can see that happen, okay? So now we look at this same house with a 5% interest rate. So what is this? Buy today, refinance tomorrow, okay? What does the cash flow do? It goes to 472. It's because the mortgage payment drops by $270. Okay, so 2% on a loan of 220 grand ish has an impact of $270. Well, 
What does that do? And I'll dive into more of this. What does that do to the cash on cash ROI? 1.88 to 5.42%, okay? Bumps it a ton. And rates go down, what's gonna happen to values? Go up. Likely to go up, right? Rates go down, stimulate, values go up. So let's say over a three year period, this house goes up 10%. Which I think it'll go up drastically more than that, in this, especially in that market, but let's just say 10%. So if you were to wait three years, buy it at 5% interest, and it goes up 10%, you're talking about $28,000 more that you're paying for this house. Well, the difference in payments is $270 a month. Let's use that whole number, although some of that goes towards principal. But let's just assume $270, that's about $3,200 a year, so it's $9,000, $10,000. So the delta is $18,000. So you're better off buying today, refinancing tomorrow by $18,000. Okay, so this is just a tool I wanted to start off with that we're using right now um, to, help, to help people get off the, off the fence. Uh, you're in a position to buy, but you're waiting for rates to go down. Let me educate you on what that's actually gonna look like and how you're better off buying today. When you then start to really dive in and talk about the principal reduction, the depreciation, the tax benefits, there's all these other profit centers inside of real estate. Whether it's a primary or investment, there's, there's some benefit. Um, then it gets even more obvious as to why it still makes sense to buy today. Okay? So this is just one of the tools um, that, that we're using, but I wanna dive in to a little bit more of my background, how I've used real estate and how I teach other people to use it. Um, and hopefully there's something you can get from this and you can plug it into your guys' business. I'm a big advocate that there's plenty of business for everybody. You know, I think especially in real estate, it's 90, 10, maybe 80, 20 game that the people, you know, there's a small chunk that are doing the vast majority of business. Um, and, and there's plenty of business out there. And so anything I do to, to help is great. <clears throat> These are the first three houses that I bought. Okay. Typical young, Buy a house, live in it for a year, move out, buy another house, live in it for a year or two, move out, and those were my first rental properties. So I didn't have enough money to buy rental properties, okay? But I bought from 04 to 07. Historically, looking back, arguably one of the worst times to ever buy, right? Because what happened right after? The market crashed. So it went down. One thing I want to point out, and this is very big to my whole strategy, the 135 house went to 115. The 275 house went to 250. The 650 house went to 500, right? The bigger the house, the bigger the drop when it crashed, okay? Well, I still have all these houses today. And the value is about 2.1 million. And I've gotten cash flow along the way. Some of them I own out right now. They've, they've been paid off and I just collect rent every single month. Um, and so, the total cash flow plus the value is 2.75 million versus 865,000, okay? Um, and I show this to really illustrate the power of time. And where most people go wrong in real estate is when the market softens or the market turns, they panic and they sell. And real estate's all about the power of time, right? And it's not about timing the market. Because the reality is, can we time the market perfectly? No, honestly, you just get lucky most of the time. Right? Look at day trading in stock. Uh, Wall Street doesn't do it. Uh, if there was a way to do it predictably and always win, they would dominate that market, and they don't. Um, I have the same mindset in real estate, and I, I use these examples to teach a lot of, it's not like, don't wait for interest rates to go down, or don't wait for the market to start exploding because you're gonna be too late at that point. Just buy, just constantly be buying. And you fast forward 10, 20, 30 years, you're always gonna win. But you have to buy the right type of real estate. Um, all of those properties that I had were cash flow positive. And that enabled me to hold them when the, when the market crashed, okay? Um, how many people, there's some people in here that were in the market back then. I was doing investment real estate, helping clients from 2004 to 2007. And we were doing everything, fixing flips, developing, we were spec building homes, and most of my clients got absolutely destroyed because they were spec building an $800,000 house and the market crashed. 
their mortgage is 4,500 bucks and the most they can rent it for is 2,000 because there's not very many customers for that type of house. So it's either I write a check for $2,500 a month for who knows how long, I sell it, write a check for 300 grand, which nobody did, or I just wait and give the keys to the bank, right? And that's what most people did. Um, as a result of all of that and analyzing all that, my own portfolio, my client's portfolio, I came up with a strategy. And it was one, I don't ever want to get that call again. Uh, I'm negative cash flow, thousands of dollars. I'm upside down equity, hundreds of thousands of dollars. What should I do? Because I don't have a solution for that, right? Um, so I created a strategy that's all centered around entry level single family homes, okay? The houses that are very predictable, you always have customers for. Think of your three, four bed, two, two and a half bath, two car garage, just boring, vanilla type of house, okay? Um, for me, this is my current portfolio and I just do exactly what I teach. Here's 18 years later, you know, I showed you those first three houses, but my total market value is over 14 million and I owe 22.8, right? So I'm at 25% debt. And I'm in a phase of my planning where I'm trying to now pay everything off. You know, we use debt to grow. And, and you grow and you accumulate, you buy, 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 but at some point the end goal is to own real estate free and clear. And that's my end goal for all of my clients. How do we get you to a point where you own real estate free and clear, you sleep well at night, and you just get mailbox money, <clears throat> okay? Because most people, they bought into the normal system, they're making decent salaries, they've got a 401k, they've got equity in their house, um, but they fast forward 10, 20, 30, 10, 20 years, and they're not on track. They're not gonna accumulate enough wealth to live the lifestyle they want, and so then there's the solutions just keep working. You know, so many of my clients come in in their 40s and 50s saying, what do I do? And they're above average, like they're doing better than the majority of people, but it's still not good enough, and that's where we insert real estate, okay? Um, what does it look like in four years? Here's my, my personal portfolio um, is I'm gonna have them all paid off. And right now my real estate is paying off my real estate. I just take my cash flow every single month and I apply it towards those other houses, okay? This is the end goal, whether it's one house, two houses, 10 houses, 20 houses, um, a couple houses home free and clear in retirement for people can make a huge difference, right? If they can get three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month of residual income, it only goes up because rents always go up over time and they don't have to deplete the value of their portfolio. Okay. Um, this is really what I teach. Okay. All of our clients for the most part are pretty ordinary people. We're pretty ordinary people. Um, but it's all about the game plan. It's about discipline and, and it's about executing that that really separates I think the people that experience a higher level of success versus those that don't in any aspect of life. Okay. Um, there's my family. Uh, I'm really big on the why, uh, especially when it comes to wealth building or planning for the future, making sacrifices today for, for tomorrow. If people don't have a strong why, they're just not going to do it and they're not going to stick to it. And so often my process is going through and, and narrowing down what is that why and what's going to motivate you to actually execute the game plan that we're going to set. I, for me, it's my family. Um, and when I do longer presentations and stuff, I go through and um, we just moved into this new house. It's, it's an awesome house and we built it to entertain. And my wife sent me pictures last night and I think there was like four eight kids at my house. <laughs> like three different, friend, three different kids had these parties. They were in the pool and the basketball court and got a golf simulator. Like it was just nutso over there. Um, but that's my wife, right? We, we built that on purpose so we could host, we could entertain, we could create an awesome environment, positive energy for all these kids to come to. Okay. Uh, I live in Linden, up in Utah County. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this is kind of my thesis, okay? The whole strategy of, of my real estate system is built off of this. Create, manage, protect, grow. And before we talk about real estate, let's talk about money. Okay, um, there's a lot of people that are pretty good at managing money, but they're not very good at making it, right? And it's really hard to protect it and grow it if you don't have very much coming in. So it always starts with creating, 
Okay, you have money coming in. How many people know somebody who's made a decent amount of money that doesn't manage it very well and lives paycheck to paycheck? Nobody in this room, but we all know somebody, right? <laughs> um, or think of the environment that we were all in the last three, four years when I assume many of us had career best years and this year probably isn't following that up and are we stressed or did we manage our money appropriately so we're just fine? And we can still pump money into marketing when other people are, are, are restricting their marketing budgets, right? Like, like what did we do during that time? But it all starts here. <coughs> You've gotta have enough coming in, but then you have to manage it. And the sad part is most people spend most of their time on the creation, right? You, you trade time for dollars, but you work on your skill set, you practice scripts, you come to things like this. Like we spend a ton of time on how do we better ourselves so we can make more money, but how much time do we actually spend managing our money? How much time do you guys spend budgeting and going actuals versus budget? Very much? Mm. Couple. Okay? <laughs> and that's how every room is, no matter how big the audience is, very few people actually spend an appropriate amount of time managing for how much effort they put in to create it, to make it, okay? So there's a big disconnect here. Well, if we can create and we can manage, now we can worry about protecting, right? Insurance plays a key role right here. Like sometimes I have clients come through and we start looking at stuff and I'm like, you're making 500 grand a year, you have all these things and you have, you shop Geico online and you have like minimums for your car insurance. Like what are you doing? You work so hard in these two elements that if you don't protect it properly, you get in a wreck or something happens, it's gone, right? So let's spend time here too because most of us don't spend enough time. And, and this is also investing, right? What are we doing with it? And ultimately, you've got to have all three of those in order to grow, okay? I do the same thing with real estate and I'll show you how in just a second. A couple other things just on money, okay? If anything, this is the part where you should take something, right? Take, take away from this. Wealth is quiet, rich is loud, poor is flashy. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Uh, how many raptors do you see on the street, <laughs> right? Or how many 80 to $140,000 vehicles do you see out there right now? And I would say the vast majority of those people fall right here, okay? They're not wealthy. They don't, their bank accounts aren't flush. They, they, could, they still have to work, right, in order to create or sustain what their lifestyle, okay? Um, you know, on the lending side of things, we get to see everything. We get to see people's bank statements and credit card statements and all of this stuff. And you get to see how much income's coming in and what they have left and the lifestyle that they're living. And there's a lot to learn through that process, okay? Everybody on my loan team, we talk about that often. And we'll use case studies, right? Of like, okay, here's this person that's making X amount of dollars who's trying to buy this. It should be very easy, but, but why, why is it so hard for them? Well, look where all their money's going, okay? Um, it's so easy to fall into these two categories. I don't know how many of you know someone that is extremely wealthy. Um, I have an uncle on the wrong side of the family, unfortunately for me, that's like billionaire, <laughs> his dad status and the guy shops at Walmart. I kind of joke like he's been wearing fanny packs when they were in style, but when they were out of style, now they're back in style. Like he's always been wearing them. Like you would run into him anywhere and you would think he's just a normal dude, but it's he's got nothing to prove because he's got 800 million sitting in his bank. Right. Um, I won't labor on this. Rich people stay rich by living like they're broke. Broke people say broke by living like they're rich. And then I just talked about this one, right? Show me where you spend your money and I'll tell you what your priorities are. Like this is a good activity for you guys to go home and do. I'm gonna say, hey, where did my money just go? And you may quickly realize that your priorities are Starbucks and Maverick. <laughs> uh, or those are much more of a priority than they should be, right? Like, like where's money leaking out? And, and where can you plug it, and what type of difference can that make, okay? This is just the reality. 
I know many of us don't fit this category. We live in a little bit of a bubble where we're, we're surrounded by a lot of upper middle class type of people, but, but this is the reality, okay? Um, net worths are not good. Look at this for retirement. A third of people have nothing. 13% of people have 300K or more. How much is it gonna take to retire? Yeah, a million? No. no. <laughs> two, three million? Maybe. Right? You get two, three million, you annuitize it, you make 5% a year, you make 100 or 125 grand a year. Like that probably works, but you're not taking all the grandkids on a Disney cruise every year. Right? And if you have a bunch of health problems, it can, it can disappear pretty quick. Okay? So the vast majority of people are just not in good financial shape. Right? So, one, we have to be very careful on who we take financial advice from. There's a lot of people throwing it out, right? Especially social media, all of that. But friends, like, let's be careful of who we're taking financial advice from because a lot of people are that flashy, but they're not really wealthy. Um, I like to use this example. When I'm at like, I don't know, some boring corporation or something, I usually use a Honda Accord, but it's a real estate, <laughs> so I figured I'd go Tesla. Um, but, just how are we spending our money and what's our mindset and our approach towards it, okay? There's nothing wrong with buying this car if you're creating, managing, protecting, investing. If you have all that happening, you can still do that, great, right? But a lot of people don't. And here's the, what I want you to get from this is the difference there. One, is there that much difference in the car? <clears throat> Not much, okay? And the perception is pretty much the exact same, right? But a $50,000 difference. If you put that $50,000 in some investment account, it averaged 12% over 30 years, it's 1.5 million. So how many times are we out making purchases and we're just looking at the difference in price or even worse, we're looking at the difference in payment. But what if we approached it like, oh, I can afford this, but I'm going to buy this and I'm going to invest this difference. And that's a $1.5 million decision, not a $50,000 decision. And that's every day, right? You look at a small scale, eating out, and I don't know, getting water instead of a soda, or whatever it is, right? It just compounds. And all those little things just add up, add up, add up, add up, add up. And that's the easiest place to find where, where's that money leaking out. But more importantly, as you plug those holes, have a plan for that, right? Because you're already living without it. And now if you can all of a sudden recreate it, now what do I go do with it? Okay. Um, oh, here's my Mavericks and Starbucks. <laughs> so I show this, if you eliminate $4 a day and you invested it in 30 years, it's worth $369,000. What about if you didn't eat out? <clears throat> okay, 15 bucks a day, if you just invested that instead, million dollars. Like when you go out to eat for lunch, are you thinking, huh, if I didn't do this, this is worth this much money in, in the future. Um, I've been blessed and fortunate to make good money and I could eat out, out every single day and be totally fine. I pack a lunch every single day. Um, one, I'm healthy. Two, I absolutely hate taking time to go to lunch um, and, and disrupting production hours. Uh, but three, I understand this concept and I teach it so I have to practice it. But yeah. Um, where are those leaks happening? Okay. Um, so here's my box, okay? Now I'm gonna tie real estate into this. And this is, the, this is my investment philosophy, okay? One, you create wealth by what's my strategy? What markets am I gonna buy in? How am I gonna buy? What am I gonna buy? Because inside of real estate, there's a ton of different ways to do it. Everyone agree? Um, investing in real estate can mean a variety of different things. And done right, they can all work. There's not like, my way is better than another, it's just there's just a lot of different ways to do it, um, but there's a lot of different risk assessments to be done as well. And how much return are you getting and how much risk are you willing to expose yourself to in order to get that potential return, okay? So this is where it starts for me. And for us, when I first started this specific strategy, Buy and hold entry level single family homes. 2009, as a result of the crash. It was just in Utah. And we did two, 300 houses in Utah. 
and I started getting referrals from customers, <coughs> brother-in-laws or friends or whoever all over the country, and I realized, wait a sec, like, I know my strategy and I know my box that I'm working in is my own backyard the best place to do this. Most people in real estate, they only think of their own backyard. Most real estate agents cover their area. Most people that buy rental properties do it in their own area, but they don't approach their stock portfolio like that. Right? I promise none of you have had a conversation with your stock advisor saying, I live in Southern Utah, I really know Vegas, and I'm comfortable with Northern Utah, I want you to build my whole stock portfolio with companies that are based here. You wouldn't have access to 99 point whatever percent of the market. But you rely on them to understand the entire domestic market, maybe international market, based on your risk tolerance, your time frame, all those different things to go invest your money appropriately. Right? But nobody really thinks about that for real estate. They just think my own backyard. Well, is that hard to invest in St. George right now? Is there a positive cash flow if you buy, if you don't put 40% down? There's just not. And why? It's because values grew so much faster than rents from 2010 to 2022. Um, and did values outpace wages? Like there's a, there's a lot of factors, yes, that, that create not an ideal environment. But are there other markets that are very, very different? So what we did is I said, okay, well, I know my exact strategy. Now I'm going to understand the entire market on a, on a domestic level. And I'm going to analyze two, 300 markets, and I'm going to determine what markets are best for my strategy that I'm going to go set up infrastructure in those markets. So that's my whole business model. So in 2009, 10, we went to Phoenix, we went to Vegas, and for about four or five years, we had like 2,300 houses in those markets. I got Jake back here. He bought in Phoenix, right? Oh, yes. Hey, shout out to Jake Burt. Burke Brothers, you guys seen Burke Brothers come into town? Oh yeah. Jay's a good friend yeah, yeah. and he's been a client forever and he's in a sling right now. He, he what was it two weeks ago, week ago? Yeah. He pulls over to help some random person change their tire. He's a tire guy. <laughs> and the car is sliding off the, the jack and he lifts the thing up and tears his bicep off. So he's had to get a retouch. I was gonna say like a kid was running under it and you like lifted it up or something, but no. <laughs> my mind is your incredible suit. Yeah, it's, it's my bride's moment, but. Yeah, you're not 25 anymore. <laughs> right. There's a story there. But Jake's bought, how many houses have you bought? I've got five. Yeah. Jake's bought five houses with us and just plugged into the system and he's been doing it for 10 plus years. Okay. Um, so it's, it's finding the market and then setting up infrastructure in those markets. So how do we source the houses? How do we make sure we can rehab them if they need rehab? How do we finance them? How do we get insurance? How do we do all that? And so we just set it all up so it's super turnkey, okay? Um, managing. I like to say you can buy the right house in the right market, the right condition, for the right price, and if you have the wrong management, it can go really bad. And that can be self-managing. I don't know how many of you have rental properties or self-manage or know people. Oftentimes we manage more with our heart than we do as a business owner um, and we get taken advantage of. And we eliminate that in our system. Say, nope. And plus you're buying, you know, in a, in a market you don't live anyway, so it's not really an option. Um, but in my experience, I self-managed before as well. And I don't increase rents like I should. I'm lenient, I don't charge late fees. I buy into their sad stories and their loser husbands and the this and the that. Um, and you fast forward and it's like, huh, I'm, I'm $300 a month under market on this house. I'm paying those guys 3,600 bucks a year to live in my house. Like just not great business, right? Um, so managing. So how do you manage? What type of financing are you doing? We do 30 year fixed rate mortgages on everything, okay? Right now, arms are kind of popular because it's, oh, okay, put an arm on here. There's not a huge incentive anyways to do an arm, but it's how do I get this payment just a little bit lower, but single family, long-term real estate with a 30-year fix is such a powerful hedge against inflation, right? You know exactly where you're gonna be. If rates go down, you can capitalize on it. If they go up, you're glad you have what you have, okay? So it just makes it very predictable. And that's my whole model is about just predictability, okay? Then how do you protect it, right? That comes insurance. When we first started doing this, we had clients getting their own insurance, and it's like, 
some guy who lives in California that's buying a house in Florida, calls his insurance guy in California, and he's not really licensed in Florida, but he knows somebody who is, and da 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 or it's an Allstate guy, and he calls an Allstate guy out there, um, and, and they were shopping premium instead of coverage. And we realized, you're trying to save $13 a month, but if something happens, you're exposed. So let's stop doing that. Let's educate you about insurance. Make sure you get the right insurance on the property, okay? Again, you work so hard to do all this. Let's make sure we protect it. And ultimately, that's how you grow. So how does this work in real estate, okay? Um, this is a tool. Take a picture of this when I'm all done with it. This is a tool that you can teach clients, okay? For-profit centers inside of real estate. First and foremost, cash flow, okay? Um, positive cash flow to me is protection, okay? My clients that are buying a house right now, it's 100 to $250 a month positive cash flow. Is that life-changing? No. If they have $90,000 to put down on an investment property, are they buying it for the $200 a month cash flow? No. If they need that for groceries, let's not buy the house, right? Um, so, but it's protection because what if the market softens? Can you just can you just sit and keep collecting cash flow? Do rents in entry level single family homes ever really go down? No, no. Two thousand eight nine, we never reduced rents one time on these types of houses. What's happening to rents right now? Why are they going up? Are more or less people buying? Less. Less, but they still need a place to live, right? So we have more demand for our products when the market softens or slows, and that provides protection. Even though values may not be going up, even though values may be softening a little bit, we continue to have high demand, and that's protection, because we just hold, and then we just wait, and wait, and wait, and over any five, 10 year period of time, does real estate always go up? Always has, okay? So, that's number one, okay? What does the, what does the cash flow situation look like? Number two is principal reduction. I also call that deferred cash flow. And this is a profit center that a lot of times people don't think about. So you have to remind them, hey, every month you make a mortgage payment, a certain percentage of that mortgage, in, in my typical house, a $300,000 house, it's about $300 a month, is going towards principal. That's deferred cash flow. That's your money. It's just on your balance sheet because you don't realize it until you sell it. But it's yours and it's guaranteed. Right? Every time you make a mortgage payment, principal goes down, no matter what. No matter what the market's doing, you're gonna get that back, okay? That represents about a 4% ROI, and then you have depreciation and tax savings. Does everyone understand how the depreciation works? Um, I'll give you a quick example. One of my houses is 300 grand. You back out the land, 25 grand. That's why they're so cheap out there, because the dirt is 15 grand. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you back out the land, so that's 275,000. That's your basis, that's your starting point. You divide that by 27 and a half years, because that's what the IRS says, and you get $10,000 a year of depreciation on one of these types of houses. That 10,000 offsets ordinary income. So it can offset that profit center, it can offset that profit center, it can carry over to W-2 income, it can offset any sort of active ordinary income. Okay, normal depreciation can. So, that represents about a 3% return on your investment, okay? Um, on the tax savings, and you experience that every single year, so you actually feel that. So you feel this one, you feel this one, this one's deferred, okay? Those three combined, right now, nine to 10%. You know, if I was standing here two years ago, that would have been 11 to 15%, because cash flow was greater, because rates were, some, were, were lower, but, that's, the, that's kind of the basis of it, okay? Up, down, sideways markets, you're about gonna get that, okay? Where true wealth is created is in appreciation, especially when you leverage, so when you get loans. Okay, a $300,000 house, if you put $100,000 into it, and it goes up 10%, that's $30,000, that's a 30% return on your 100 grand, okay? With 100 grand, you can only buy 100,000 of Apple stock, no matter how you, how you look at it. If Apple goes up 10%, that's 10 grand. You compound that year over year over year over year, and that's why real estate just dominates any other investment out there, is because of the leverage component. But, and that I kind of showed as a 15 to 30% ROI, 
So in the end, we're targeting 25% plus ROIs with a really boring, vanilla, predictable real estate strategy. Just buy and hold, okay? Um, to me, there's not another investment out there that, that can compete with this. And can you use this even in a market like this? What if, that, what if that's negative 2%? Well, do they still get principal reduction? Do they still get depreciation? Do we still feel like this market's gonna appreciate over a five to 10 year period of time? So maybe that number goes to 22 to 37%. Is that still pretty attractive? But you have to be able to have the conversation with them and know their financial situation that, hey, you're negative 300 bucks a month. I know that's not gonna stretch you. You're good, we're gonna plan on that, but we're doing that on purpose because you realize all of this, okay? You can still buy in a market like this if you can help teach this, especially if you show them the potential for the refinance to get that negative cash flow back in three years, okay? That makes sense, any questions on that? Um, this is a lot of stuff. This is busy. I'll send all these out. I'll get them to Drew, and he can he can shoot all these out in the PDF. This is it. When I sell real estate or help people convince them to buy real estate, it's not about today. It's always about ten plus years down the road, because it's not very exciting if you just look at it today, right? Like if we looked at Jake's portfolio and looked at the amount of money that he put in and we looked at the amount of his holdings today, it's gonna be drastically different because it's just the power of time. You know, we bought a couple houses in Arizona for like 90 grand yeah. and sold them for like 250 and you know, turned two houses into four houses and, and he didn't put any new cash into it, right? Um, so what I'd like to show is if you bought two houses a year for five years and put it on cruise control, okay? so. Each house cash flow is 200 bucks a month. So you're $400 a month of cash flow year one. Well, rents go up on average two to 5%, depending on the year, market conditions, all of that. So those two houses, rent's gonna continue to go up every single year, um, and then you add houses to it. But I like to show this for what it looks like. I'm just gonna fast forward the summary. Hold on. Um, in 20 years, okay? So. We put in $850,000, two houses a year, so 170, 80 grand a year for five years, okay? In 20 years, the annual cash flow is 290,000. The cash on cash ROI is 34%. Principal reduction, depreciation, the internal rate of returns 43%, right? What did I just show you, nine to 10%, 11% when they buy it? Look how much higher it is in 20 years. What about if we average 6% a year in appreciation? Well, we bought 2.75, now it's worth 7.4. We made 4.6, that's an extra 27%. We're like 60, 70% ROI. Like it just gets stupid when you look at it and fast forward it out. This is exactly what I showed you in my own portfolio. Like I didn't do anything special. In fact, I timed the market really bad for the first part, right? If I would have looked four years into my real estate investing, I was upside down. If I would've just short sold everything, I probably would've never bought a house again. I'd been like, this real estate stuff sucks, right? But I had positive cash flow and I was able to write it up. So this is the power, this is the why. Um, and again, even in a market like this, could negative cash flow still make sense? Absolutely it could, okay? If you can, if you can illustrate this. Um, where do we buy and then I'm gonna kinda, I'll end with uh, an idea I have, I've been using with other agents in Utah, Nevada, Arizona, California, like a lot of these Western states where they have clients, even property managers, where they have clients that have a ton of equity in their homes. But when you do an analysis and you look at it, it's like, ah, you're not making a great ROI. I could help you sell this house, and guess what? I have a system we could help plug you into, and we could double your cash flow with new capital investment, and it creates listings for you guys. Okay, I'll end with that. But where we buy, Florida, Arkansas, Tennessee, we're buying first and foremost where everybody's moving to. I mean, look at migration. Like it's, it's crazy. The West is up just a little bit in 2022. Um, that's because of Arizona primarily, people moving into. Obviously people are moving out of California, but they're moving to Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. We're just on a lot smaller scale. We hardly have any people here. 
but they limit us out, okay? So we're in Florida, Tennessee, Central Florida, and then single families. Um, this is very interesting because for the first 13, 14 years I was doing this, we didn't compete much with institutional. Because I think there's this, there's this aura out there of you graduate from single family to multifamily, or bigger is better. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I just look at, well, where, where are the returns? Or it's how many doors do you own? Like, so people are so fixed on how many doors do you own? I'm like, no, 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 what's your ROI? And, and how's your portfolio performing? That's what matters to me, not how many doors you have, right? Um, but institutions, big hedge funds, REITs, they primarily haven't done single family because it's too much work. Because it's so much work, if they need to place $500 million, how many single family homes do you have to find? How many do you have to look at, do due diligence on to actually go and do it? versus just going and buying some big apartment complexes or something. Um, that's shifted drastically over the last three years. Um, here's an article that they predict institutions will hold 40% of all single family rental homes in the United States by the end of the decade. <coughs> here's a couple examples. JLL, massive um, REIT, is planning to acquire up to 500 million in single family homes in the next two years. This is JP Morgan. They're investing 415 million of equity to buy, what is it, two, one billion in single family homes. Um, and it just goes on and on. Wall Street talking about real estate investment trusts, all these different people as a relatively high yielding hedge against inflation. So you have all these massive institutions that are now coming in and buying single family. Um, to me, it means there's something to it, right? These people are super smart, a lot smarter than we are. Um, and have massive resources, and they're coming in and buying this, this type of asset class more than they ever have before, okay? Um, this just shows institutional. Um, this data is a little old. This is just from 2021, but it continues to go up and up and up and up, okay? Um, I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes on this. I won't dive into this. These are the houses we buy, okay? <laughs> we break it down by the four profit centers. Cash on cash ROI, cash on cash plus principal reduction, internal rate of returns so we add in depreciation, and then the appreciation. So our main focus is right here, but then that's the upside, okay? And it's super attractive to people when they can see, oh, this is really predictable, that's safe, but I have upsides of these types of returns, okay? And we have different assumptions of, of appreciation and rent increases and all that type of stuff that's taken from a lot of data. Okay. Um, Memphis, Tennessee, here's another example of a house, brand new house, 1,700 square feet, four bed, two bath, two car garage on a quarter acre for 213 grand. We just bought this one two days ago. Okay. Um, rents for, for 21.50. You start to compare these markets to here, it's like, okay, what do you, you're gonna spend what, 475 on a townhouse to get similar rents and so it's, Okay, we spent 150 grand less to get the same amount of revenue. That just makes sense for a business standpoint. Okay. Um, and that's that's my whole model is just giving people access to these types of markets. It's very turnkey. Um, Northwest Arkansas, uh, McCray has one out there. Oklahoma City. Um, okay, I'm gonna end with this, and then we'll do open up for Q and A for anyone who wants to stick around. Um, oh, crash or correction. <laughs> A lot of people are waiting for this crash to come, okay? I, I do not see a crash coming. Um, I do see correction. Did we get artificially inflated values during the whole COVID madness? Absolutely, we're just giving some of that back. Um, you look at the difference of mortgage delinquencies, okay? We're healthier today than we were pre-COVID. Look where it was when the, when the financial crisis happened. Um, you look at the amount of, of equity in homes, the average household has 55% equity in their house. If they lose their job and they can't make the mortgage payment, I promise they're not gonna short sell. Like they, they can't. Um, they're not gonna just stop making the payment and wait to get foreclosed on, they're just gonna sell it. And maybe they have to fire sell it. Great, they're still gonna walk away with money. Um, you know, one of the ways we source homes is auctions and foreclosures and we track that very, very closely. We have teams that go to all the auctions every single day and all of that and there's just not much activity. It's not really picking up. Like a little bit more than it was during COVID because you had like the get out, get out of jail free card. 
uh, don't make your payment and you won't get foreclosed on, but that's going away. And so foreclosures are picking up, but they're still historically low. Um, okay, here's a couple rentals for our clients that they had rentals in Utah. We sat down with them and said, okay, let's look at how it's performing. And then I'll show you what we, what we did with it. So here's one. He bought it for 369. This was like a 1940s house. It had lipstick on it, but the guts of it were still really old. And so he was kind of getting eaten alive on some repairs and maintenance. Um, but his end of the day, his cash flow is about $250 a month. And we did this one about a year ago. Um, annual cash flow, he had $200,000 of equity in it. Okay. Um, and he was making three grand, so he's making 1.48%. Okay, so we sold this and we took that 200 grand and we bought three houses. He added $25,000 to that. Okay, so he had to be able to do that. Otherwise, we would have bought two houses and done 34% down payment instead of 25 or whatever it is. Okay, but he had that, so that was part of the strategy. And now he was cash flowing $634 a month, which was 7,600, 3.4%. Well, like when you look at it, he went from 249 to 634, 1.48 to 3.44. Look at the increases. Compound that year over year over year, project that out over five, 10, 15 years, and it's massive difference. Okay, it's so much more than just, hey, we can help you get $400 more a month. $400 more a month, is that even worth it, right? Um, it's, no, 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 let me show you. Let me show you the power of that. Okay, um, here's another one in St. George. This is Castle Rock. I think it's on like Dunside or Dunsling or something like that. Um, and this guy bought this as a primary. So this house was built in 2004. He bought as a primary, I think in 2010 or something. Um, lived in it for a while, and then it's been a rental for like six or seven years. Okay, rents for 2,700 bucks. He's cash flowing 650 dollars, which doesn't seem that doesn't suck. But what's his ROI and how much money does he have in it? So he's got $300,000 of equity in it that's producing this amount, okay? This one wasn't quite as obvious. So what we, what we do is I come in and I say, look, here's how much capital you have. Here's your cash flow every month. If it goes up every single year, you get appreciation, you get all this. Here's what your current house looks like over a 10, 15, 20 year period of time. Because first, I have to show them, here's your current investment, here's what it looks like, okay? Now, if we sold it, what does it look like, okay? There's current, looking at it a little bit differently. Now, if we sold it, and we went and bought three houses, what does it look like? And here's, here's the difference. So if you look at it over five years, if we sold it, he's gonna be at 14 grand versus 9,400. Okay, of cash flow. His ROI is a little bit higher. Total ROI, 21 to 26. If you fast forward out 20 years, the gap is even greater. This one wasn't quite as obvious as the last one. He ended up keeping it. Okay, he didn't sell it. So this is one that we didn't actually generate the transaction from, but this is the analysis, this is the process. And the guy who owns this is a loan guy, you probably all know his name, I think. Um, so I won't say it, but he just couldn't get over the fact of I'm selling a property that's got a 2.75% interest rate and I'm going to go borrow a seven. Like he just could not get past it. And we have that conversation a lot right now um, of where it makes sense or where it doesn't, you know, doing a cash out refinance to pull out equity to go buy more houses. Does that make sense? Usually it never does if their rates are super low, you know, so it's more of you need to sell it. And, and get all the equity out, and can we generate enough new cash flow that it makes sense to you, okay? But- And you're saying it didn't? This one, it did make sense. He, he had a net benefit to do it, but just not as great of a benefit. So it wasn't so much a, oh, this is a no brainer, let's do it, yeah. you know? Um, as you can tell, I'm a, I'm a geek. I love analytics, I love numbers, like I love analyzing. Um, I love sitting down with people and just saying, okay, where are you at? Let's just, let's just start, you know, let me show up with a blank piece of white paper and let's just start brainstorming and let's just crunch numbers. Cause to me, it's all numbers. Like there's no emotions involved in this. This is investing. And a lot of people insert emotions and I teach them about their investment goggles. And we have a lot of those conversations 
of, of just eliminate that because it's all numbers, you know? And this one's a little different. He lived in it and this and that. And, you know, what if his kids get married and they want to live in the house they grew up in and blah, blah, blah. Like there's all these emotions that were inserted in, into this. <clears throat> yep. Um, that's it. Here's what I would recommend for you guys to do uh, with your clients. Do portfolio reviews. If you have clients that own investment properties, say, hey, I would love to do a uh, portfolio analysis. Nobody's doing that for them. Their stockbrokers should be doing a semi-annual or annual sit down with them. Insurance guys use this as a tool all the time. Hey, you're coming up for renewal. Let's sit down. Let's look at stuff. What's changing your life? What's this? What da, 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 da. And yes, you're trying to retain that, but you're also looking for opportunities for your business. You know, and that's kind of the real reason to doing it. But if you can sit down and say, let's just review your portfolio. I'll, I'll give you an outlook of what your home's worth. If you can give me a mortgage statement and rent and give me some information, I can calculate some ROIs. Like, let's see how it's performing. And I would just start with that. I do that every year with all my clients. You act like that's so easy. And we're not in that position. It's like, sure. But you can figure it out. Easy. You can figure it out. <laughs> Here's the deal. All you have to do is know a little bit more than that. Because you're the expert in their minds. So just know a little bit more than them. You don't have to know as much as me. Um, just know a little bit more than them, and that's good enough. I promise you. Um, tax strategies. Okay, I have a lot of tax review and tax strategy conversations with my clients. Um, on the call earlier with Drew, we do a thing with all of our self-employed clients where every January, February, we start reaching out to them saying, hey, send us your tax returns before you file. Let's make sure you're gonna be in a position that we can still accomplish your 2024 purchase plans based on how you're planning on filing your taxes. Right, just have those conversations with them. Wait, you do that as their realtor? I do it as their consultant. Call me their consultant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and again, it's different, right? My business model is very different. I know their financial situations inside and out, but that's how I'm qualified to advise them on their real estate purchase plans. Because if I didn't know everything that was going on, then I'm just trying to sell them a house. Versus, no, 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 I'm trying to fit this into your overall plan. I know you're doing some of this with that money and da 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 da, da. And I help my clients like and surround you themselves. Any state? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, mm -hmm. But this is where I think there's opportunity for you guys that this, your clients are not receiving this right now. They're not getting proactive analysis or feedback on their portfolio because most real estate agents, they sell them an investment property and then they're gone. And they have no idea how did that property actually perform, right? They, they don't really know. My model is obviously very different where I'm held to a very high standard. They're buying a house they've never seen and I have to make sure it performs, right? Um, and I've got two clients in here and I think they say it's performed better than I projected on the, on the pro forma you know, overall. And so we try to set realistic expectations and all of that, but I've got to make sure it performs. But by doing that, then that enables me to go back for more business. I don't do any marketing. You don't see my social media. My website's probably like 10 years outdated. Like I do absolutely zero marketing. 100% of my business is repeat and referral. And 70, 75% of my transactions every year are repeat customers. So we're helping to buy number two or number 10 or number 20. And I go to them in five years and say, hey, McCray, you bought this house for 225, it's worth 325 now, and we could sell it, and we could exit Central Florida, and we could go buy in Greensville, South Carolina, because we could sell one and buy two and double your cash flow, right? And it works for him because we're improving his ROI, and then it creates transactions for us. Um, and that's our whole model. It's all driven on relationships but creating that value of what sets us apart. You know, how, why are we qualified to advise you and why are you gonna listen to us? Um, where we can partner is, I'm happy to be inserted into this process. Um, again, I deal with a lot of agents, property managers all over the place where they're like, hey, I've got a guy that I can partner with that can give you access to these markets and he can help sit down and analyze this property. So I'm happy to come in and people on my team to help do that analysis of could it make sense to sell? Of course, all those listings go back to you guys. I work with so many people in mortgage, real estate, all of that, that 
it's just a huge trust factor that, you know, if you refer me business, you're 100% always going to get it back, right? Drew helped put this on. If your clients want to go buy out there, Drew's going to get the mortgage, right? Like we'll just, we'll just stimulate, um, or not stimulate, but we'll just make sure that that stays, you know, your clients, your clients, I'm just an extension of you and you're giving them access to something that they don't have access to otherwise. And could it create listings for you guys? And it would only work if you're improving their ROI. So they're gonna look at you like, oh, awesome. Like they're coming in, they're helping me analyze this, they have access to this team that can do it, get you the listing, and we improve their cash flow and their overall performance. So that's, that's where there's an opportunity, I think. Whether or not we ever do anything, that's not why I'm here, it's more of just, can I give you more tools or plant a couple seeds and how you could approach your business a little bit different and separate yourselves. That's it, Drew. On those portfolio reviews, is that something they could plug you into if they don't feel comfortable doing that? 100%, yep. So that, that would be an easy way to just plug him in as, hey, I've, I've got a guy who does this, he's got the spreadsheets, he's got it built out. Yep. Let's have him do an analysis, set up a call, and then if they decide to list and sell, Tyler's gonna kick it back to you that, hey, yeah, and, and ideally you would be involved, you know, we set up a Zoom or we do something where you're involved in it um, and you're part of it, so it's just an easy, you know, depend on the client, how comfortable you are, because our process will be finding out more information from them. Um, and it'll surprise you how much they'll give you when, when the intent is to give them advice um, that's gonna be good for them. But they'll share a lot of information you know, with us so that we can advise them properly. But yeah, hundred mm percent. -hmm. I think your clients you sold about a month ago or you're gonna go plan to talk to as well. Right now. You have a lot more business a lot of months ago than you have today. Yeah, really it's the people that have owned properties longer than that though that have equity. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's your clients that own before the COVID run up are is your lowest hanging fruit. Um, and then the ones that bought the first part of it that they've experienced that run up, but rents, as we all know, didn't go up nearly at the same pace. Yeah. Question for you, Tyler. So I've got quite a few rentals, both paid off and then uh, some with mortgages mm -hmm. at two and a half, three uh, percent. Um, our accountant told us, and I was doing the same thing. We were paying off, taking our twenty thousand a month cash yep. flow and paying the you know the ones that had the highest interest off mm -hmm. first. And then, uh, and you know Josh, you know, Josh told me, you know, don't do that. You know, you get more write-offs with the interest and all these other things. And plus we're, you know, able to, uh, uh, you know, do the reduction with each property. Mm -hmm. um, he says, take that money and, you know, put, you know, put it into something and pay cash for the next one. So you're still buying one house a year. So what's your thoughts on He's correct. If you want to maximize your tax situation, minimizing your write-offs by paying them off yeah. and reducing your interest income isn't going to necessarily benefit you the most from a tax planning standpoint. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, it's just if you want to end up uh, completely debt-free. Right? Yes. Yeah. It, at some point, it's, okay, I realize, because on a spreadsheet, it makes no sense for me to pay all these down or have all this equity sitting in the house. It would make more sense for me to go buy 50 more houses and fast forward out 12 years. It would be much greater, but it's no, no what's my plan? Am I okay owning 18 houses free and clear and I'm 35 grand a month residual income? Yes. Right. Or what other aspects of my portfolio or my investments am I doing for more growth versus, you know, a hold? But yes, he's correct in that. And you know, you're a real estate Professional, so you can probably do cost segregation and bonus depreciation and all of that, uh, you know, which is a, an added benefit. If I showed that on here, the ROI just go crazy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you manage properties then? So what we do is we we go find local property managers and just set up a relationship with them, and we go in and negotiate because of the amount of business that we do. So we, it's not a revenue source for us. I have no ownership, nothing besides I have to. I have staff, salary staff members that manage the property managers because if they don't do a good job, because you guys know property managers, they all pretty much suck. Is there <laughs> I use Brian Harenberg down here and he's awesome. I don't know if you guys know him, but um, we micromanage them. So instead of charging 10%, it's 8%. Instead of first month's 
rent for lease up fee, it's half the first month. It's this, it's that, but we have minimum debt to income, credit scores, background checks, like it's not the first person with a heartbeat to apply can they put in. It's put in the right person and, and we track all that data. You know, last year over 80% of our tenants renewed. Um, our average tenant stays about three and a half years and so we try to minimize turnovers by putting the right people in. But yeah, they report to us every single week on every single house. So I know how many clicks, how many impressions, how many showings, how many showing appointments versus show, like we know everything. What about a tax guy for real estate? Yeah, we have some. If text or email this number and I can send you a couple people. Um, but yeah, the, the tax advantages, like we just barely touched on it, but for some of your higher net worth or higher income clients, there's so many tax advantages. There's 400 write-offs of the real estate. Yeah. I don't know of anybody that we're going to have to eat that guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the tax benefits are awesome. Have you ever dealt with, um, well, we get this all the time, because we have clients and one takes care of all the financial stuff and the other one's just kind of there as decoration. Yeah. Um, and I have somebody that wants to know more, but he... It's very difficult to talk do you how do you get that person to be on board with the same stuff the other person is? The and decoration just, person? Yeah. Insist on them being in the meeting. And that's it? They're just gonna try it out. Yeah, and, and for me, like because yeah, usually there's there's the decision maker, usually the decision maker in this process is the one that's managing the finances too. Yeah. Um and so, you know, I would say the majority is typically the husband. Um, and then sometimes they're like, okay, my wife, like I need to get her buy-in in order to be able to do this, but she's gonna get overwhelmed if you just sit there and talk numbers and perform all this stuff. So it's like, okay, how do I tailor a conversation to her to get her buy-in and then I go back to him and then, okay, now let's go. But also that part where you're like, everybody's gotta cut down on shit that's stupid, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm doing it, but the other person's not like, yeah. That's where you just got to turn into a marriage counselor. We do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we deal with estates a lot where we have four siblings that all have different agendas, you know, because dad just died and now they have all these things and, da, 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 and it's a disaster. But uh, to me, it's just, it's getting them in the same room at the same time and then just having real conversations. And then you can kind of sense it's either going to go somewhere or it's not. Like, is this person, are they open to buying into this whole thing or not? That's is tricky. Was McCray the decoration person? Or oh, 100%. Person? Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, 100%. <laughs> and the diaper changer now. Yeah, that's right. Bottle feeder. Decoration and bottle feeder. <laughs> I got it wrong. But See, Tyler was legit, 100%. Everything that I, like, it was the best decision I ever made going out of state, buying myself. And I'm so glad that I did. And I didn't even know he was coming, so I didn't pay him to say all, that. All his, uh, all his projections, I, I've seen all that. That same, it's that same uh, pro forma. And all of them have exceeded all expectations. So. Thanks for crying. So, you know, maybe you want to buy another one today. So. <laughs> we'll Glad you came. Great, Scott. He, he, sent, he sent me a lot of people to buy. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? I'm just nervous on buying out of state. I own a couple in Las Vegas right yep. now, and it's hard to, in fact, I've got uh, my plumbers over there, I think either yesterday or hopefully today. So it's, it's just tough to have them out of state and not being able to drive by them, see them, smell them, taste them. And yeah, because it's a tangible asset, and that's the, that's the natural mindset of I want to touch it, feel it, drive by it, wave at it. I don't know what you do, but it's there, and you know you can go see it. You know, I've had... I have rentals down here in Little Valley. We used to buy a bunch here in like 16, 17, when you could get you know, the Salisbury houses for a hundred bucks a foot. And, um, you know, and I saw a bunch of those and I literally haven't driven by it for six years. And I come here two dozen times a year, you know, it's just, but my mindset's shifted. So we, we have that conversation a lot and it just comes down to trust. You know, and fortunately, you know, our property managers right now manage like 2,700 houses in Florida for our clients. And so we just do a ton of volume um, and we have a ton of data. And so you just, you're able to just plug into that. And, you know, because if you're a onesie, twosie, 
and you're Googling which property manager should I use out in Florida, you're gonna get screwed. You know, if they know you're across the country, they're gonna start up charging you for repairs, they're gonna do stuff that isn't needed to be done. Like every property manager has to have handyman on staff. They can't send out an electrician if an outlet's not working, the bill's at $95 an hour, they send out the handyman, the bill's at 28 bucks an hour. Like we handle all of that stuff. Um, but it is a like you have to get to a place where you can kind of trust it. I have another thing. Mm -hmm. My mom has five houses, four in Mississippi, mm -hmm. and they are being managed, but I feel like she's at a stopping point because what she likes to do is buy houses that need to be flipped. She physically flips them herself, uh -huh. and she wants to at least make 100, and sometimes if she doesn't, she ends up renting them, and she just isn't there right now financially. Uh -huh. And I feel like with as much equity as she has, she should be able to do something to keep growing. And is that something like, I want her to get on the phone with you and see if you can continue yeah. her. I mean, it's completely shifting to, I'm not as focused on like big short-term gains as much as just slower, consistent, long-term. Well, she needs more rentals. <clears throat> yeah. I know she does. And she just feels like she can't do it because she doesn't have any cash flow right now. And I'm like, I feel like there's, some kind of combination she mm -hmm. can do, and I want to learn about it yeah, too. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to. So what do I do? Just have her call the assistant, set something up with all yeah. of us? Yeah, okay. coordinate through her. She owns my life, my calendar, my everything, and yeah, if you just say, hey, we're in the St. George thing, we want to set something up, she'll just send you a Calendly and you just schedule. Okay. And then I'll likely reach out and ask for some information in advance, a little bit of like, hey, what does she have? Or like, give it's me- complicated. Yeah, give me a little bit so I can be prepared for the call. But yeah. Yeah. So say we get a client that is willing to sell their homes here and buy elsewhere. Are you representing them in those other states? Uh, complicated. No. Um, so what we do, I'll answer this as short as I can. Oh, let me go back. Um, the way that we source the houses. So we work with real estate agents, auctions, flippers, people calling for sell by owners, bank REO liquidators, like every way you can think that inventory can flow into the market, but we wanna know about these houses. So we have people out there submitting houses, dozens of houses every single day to my underwriting department, and then we put them into the pro forma and cherry pick them, and the best performing houses we then plug into our system. When you say people, you mean agents, right? Not always agents. Not always agents, okay. Yeah. But Whoever sources that house gets to do the representation. And that's how I motivate them. And we work with the top 5% of the agents. When I first started this, we used to go and, you know, every agent, the majority of the agents out there, you called them and said, I have a buyer. If I send them to you and I can send you a lot of buyers, will you give me 50%? They say, sure, right? But the agents that are dominating in the market aren't gonna work for a discount. Same thing with attorneys. CPAs, if there's a high demand for your time and you're a market leader, you're not taking coupons, right? So what we found is we're able to source better deals by working with those types of agents. So real estate commissions stay in the market. What we do in our whole revenue model, we charge an acquisition fee of $5,000, $49.95 every time somebody buys a house. And that's how we make our money for facilitating it all. Um, I am willing to share 25% of that with agents if they plug people in. Yep. So my game's a volume game, right? When you guys look at, oh geez, you guys do all this work and you make five grand a house, like it doesn't seem like that much when you're used to making 3% on an average sell of 600 grand or right, whatever it is, but we just make it up with volume. Yep. Um, so that's how that works. So hopefully it's, Maybe we generate listings. Obviously that all stays with you guys. You get a little piece of this. And I have other agents who just send me clients. It doesn't necessarily, it's not a result of a listing. It's just, I have clients that want to invest, but I can't find them anything and I'm not going to anytime soon. So here's something for them. You know, and maybe in five years we sell these and then they come back local or who knows what and it benefits them. Mm -hmm. Yep, good question. Any other questions? Good, hopefully you got something out of this. If anything, just be smarter with your money, please. <laughs> Budget. And I pick on Starbucks and Mavericks because it's easy. But if that's your thing, it's your thing. Find something else to cut out, right? There's stuff leaks all over the place. 
um, and and just be smart with it and have a plan for it. And the more you practice it personally, the easier it is to teach and have people go. Okay, thanks guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for